Oh, uh, wait, you're listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you're listening, L- listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From <laughs> WNYC. See? Yep. <laughs> I'm Latif Nasser, and this is The Other Latif. Episode 2, Morocco. Over the past few years, since I discovered I share my name with a Guantanamo detainee, I've interviewed his lawyer, Shelby Sullivan Venice, 10 times. And every time I do talk to her, Hey. Oh, hey. How's it going? Good. How are you? Sounds like you're being... It goes something like this. So let me just run you through the laundry list of stuff we wanted to talk to you about. Kind of nervous. Uh, No, no, no. (laughs) I ply her with questions about new stuff I've learned or uncovered. What did he tell you? What percentage of that would you say is true? And what percentage of that would you say is false? Mm. And she tells me what she can. Yeah. Which is never much. Again, I'm kind of doing the internal like brain vet of classified information versus unclassified. Um, Sure. Yeah. Take your time. So there's a distinction between information... Information that I know, information I don't know, and information that is either classified or declassified that the client has told me. Yeah. So I I think I can't answer that question at all, annoyingly. I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. See, Shelby's in a tough spot. As a defense attorney, she only wants to talk about stuff that helps her client's case. But she's only allowed to talk about stuff that's declassified. And the government mostly declassifies stuff that hurts her client's case. So the stuff she can talk about, she doesn't want to. And the stuff she wants to talk about, she can't. And if by accident she talks about stuff she wants to but can't because it's classified, not only could she be disbarred, she could face criminal prosecution. Yeah. Prison time. I can't exactly speak to that. Um... Unfortunately, it gets stranger when it comes to this one key document, a Department of Defense detainee assessment that surfaced in April of 2011. More leaked documents from WikiLeaks, this time concerning the U.S. detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. It's the thing I found on the New York Times website that has the list of supposedly horrible things Abdul Latif did. So this is the JTF Gitmo uh, detainee assessment. I am that... fairly certain that that's off limits. Oh, that's off limits? Because that document was leaked? I'm not supposed to talk about it, look at it, oh, wow. think about really? it, even though the world can see it. So weird. It's uh, very, uh. it's very odd. So that was the confusing space I was stepping into. In any case, when I first sat down to investigate the story of Abdul Latif Nasser, I started with that document, the 15-page Department of Defense detainee assessment of him that Shelby couldn't talk about. It had a fair amount of detail, not just about the bad things this guy supposedly did, but about his whole life. He seemed to bounce from country to country, Morocco to Libya to Sudan to Yemen to maybe Chechnya to Afghanistan, to Guantanamo Bay. He felt almost like a Forrest Gump of the war on terror. It was almost hard to know where to start. So I decided to take it from the top. If you look at the first paragraph of the section called Prior History, here's what it says. I'm going to paraphrase it because the writing is really bad. Detainee attended two years at the Hassan II University in his hometown of Casablanca. He studied chemistry and physics. But while a student, he was also an active member of the Islamic fundamentalist group Jamaat al-Adl wal Isan. Then there's a footnote. Jamaat al-Adl wal Isan is, quote, an extremist religious group that wants to replace the Moroccan monarchy with an Islamic state. Essentially, the basic gist of this story is one we've heard a million times at this point. Young, middle-class Muslim kid, for some reason, suddenly joins an extremist group. Is that what happened to Abdul Latif Nasser? Or is there more to that story? I decided the best way to find out... ...was to get on a plane. We are somewhere over the 
Atlantic Ocean, to Morocco, to talk to the people who knew him best, the people who may have even seen that transformation happen firsthand, his family. I don't know. I don't know what I can say to the family that will make them want to talk to me. Two flights and 13 hours later. We land in Casablanca. Welcome to Morocco. Welcome. We are right now, we're in one of the local red taxis. Did not imagine a left turn was going to happen there. All right. We made our way to the suburban neighborhood called Sidi Uthman. Oh, that voice is Martina Bircher from Abdul Latif's law firm, Reprieve, who set up the meeting for us. We pulled up to this pretty modest family home, got out of the car, and walked inside. It was me, my producer Susie Lechtenberg, our interpreter Tarek, all following Martina because she'd been there before. She led us to a small mosaic tiled sitting room near the front of the house. Sit down. Oh, shukran, shukran. We were told to just sit on some couches and wait for the family to come and say hello. But no one came. So we just sat there. It's World Cup time. Yeah, of course. <coughs> Tarek reminded us that the World Cup was on and we could actually hear it playing in the other room. The whole family back there? I thought, okay, maybe that's what's happening. Or maybe they were suspicious of me. I mean, a guy shows up, says he has your relative's name, but comes from the very country that has held that relative for over a decade and a half without a trial? If it was me, I'd be suspicious. As Susie put it... I've never walked into a reporting situation so blind where you really don't know what the tenor of the conversation is going to be. (laughs) And then... After a few minutes that felt way longer than they were, an older man in a yellow shirt walked in. Martina says to him, Do you know who this is? This is Abdul Latif Nasser. (laughs) He immediately just grabs me. Wraps me in a huge hug. (laughs) Other family members start coming in. I start getting more hugs. Kisses. Even from older hijab-wearing women who don't typically embrace male strangers. More and more relatives kept piling into this tiny room. Turns out Abdul Latif has seven siblings. And most of them have kids, even grandkids. So about a dozen relatives in all came out to meet me. In any case, after the greetings... They cooked us some lunch. And it's called basilla. It's a special Moroccan dish. Uh, He asked if you can stop recording. They didn't want us to record lunch. So I set my microphone down and went to wash my hands. And one of the most striking things that's ever happened to me in my life happened next. I got intercepted by a petite woman in a hijab, whom I later learned was Abdul Latif's sister, Khadija. She saw me and just gasped and, and started crying. She started speaking Arabic really fast. I grabbed our interpreter, Tarek. He told me what she said. She said that she'd known I was coming, and she, she knew that I had her brother's name, but what she didn't expect was that I was his height, that I had his build, that I looked like him, and that I was around the same age that he was when she last saw him. Looking at me, she said, and and actually would later say again and again, she felt like she'd gone back in time. uh, Uh, You took them back 20 years into the past. It's like you are a, a younger Nasser Abdullah. And out of nowhere, she grabbed my arm, switched into English, and said, Call me sister. Call me sister. 
you are like my brother. You are my brother. My brother who is still to come. She said that you are like her brother who are waiting for to come. That will be personally. I, I see the innocence that's, that's in his face, in his features that are similar to their brother. Uh, you, are, you are a new member of the family. <laughs> you are a, a brother of them. You have to know everything about <laughs> They asked to see photos of my son back home. Uh, is this a good one? Okay, here. This is my son. Hi. <laughs> How beautiful. Just then... Hi! He's this guy's age. <laughs> one of the really little kids came into the room and hugged my leg. <laughs> I kept laughing out of nervousness because it was a lot to take in. Not only did I remind them of their brother, they reminded me of my family too. Middle-class home, religious iconography on the walls. I had to keep reminding myself I, I had questions to ask them. Difficult questions that I now wasn't quite sure how to ask. Do you want to just test your mic for me? Okay. Sure. Check, 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 check. But I need you to get closer to him if that's okay. Sure. We all gathered into a circle. The family decided that uh, Abdul Latif's older brother, Mustafa, would field all the questions. Check, 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 check. He sat directly across from me. Blue button-up shirt with cuffed sleeves, gray hair. He runs a water treatment company for swimming pools. Probably the best way to start is uh, I should tell you who I am, what we're doing, why we're here. Uh, uh, I'm in uh, Canada. I was born and raised in Canada. My parents were from East Africa. But my roots go back to, to India. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, but the show I work for is from a different city, New York. Um, I am not in any way affiliated or related to the American government. In fact, I'm a journalist. We're very skeptical of the American government. So maybe the, my, my first question is kind of... Who, who is Abdul Tif Nasser? Can you tell me about him uh, as a person? Uh, Mustafa told me that his brother was actually born and raised in this very house. He was a quiet, nerdy kid. While the other two brothers would tussle with other kids in the neighborhood, Abdul Latif always had his nose in a book. He just wanted to read. I'd find him with a book here, a book there. Uh, it's because he was, uh, simply he was smart and he was into numbers and digits and there was, uh, that's what drew him into maths and sciences. And uh, He reiterated something that Shelby had told me. He was the academic star of his family, of his neighborhood. His sister chimed in at this moment to point out that it was actually annoying how smart he was. And she hated that so much because he, he used to sit the bar so high. And she, she didn't like it because it was a, such a competition to her. The parents used to draw comparisons. Oh, look at your brother, what he did, and you couldn't do the same. One thing I heard several times was that of the eight siblings, he was clearly... Uh, he, was, he was her favorite child. Their mother's favorite. Latif. His mother used to call him uh, Latif. From, uh, Latif. Latif. He and his mom shared this bond. Uh, he, she was a very conservative uh, lady. Uh, so they used to pray together to practice their religious uh, duties together. He would wake her up in the mornings and they would pray together almost as friends rather than mother and son. At the same time, everybody emphasized he was 100% secular academic for the most part. His mom was the one who encouraged him to pursue a career as a scientist. You know, his parents ran home after seeing uh, his grades posted and that he had passed high school and was accepted into college. I have to say the outlines of this were really familiar to me. 
My dad and I would wake up most mornings at like 4 a.m. to go to the mosque to pray, and I loved going with them. He was also the one who pushed me to be interested in science. In any case, Abdul Latif, he was the first of his siblings to go to university. University And his dream, according to Mustafa... His ambition was to pursue his studies until uh, the very end. He wanted to go to maybe to Australia or maybe to Canada to pursue his studies. To Canada? Really? Yeah. My home country. Huh. <laughs> Mustafa grabbed a picture of Abdul Latif as a young man and handed it to me. That was taken back when he was uh, in university. Yeah. In the picture, you see a young, clean-shaven man... Uh, short black hair, angular jaw, kind of piercing eyes. He didn't really look like me, but I could see him being, you know, a good-looking older cousin of mine. He said, uh, look at the, uh, the picture. This is not the picture of someone who will uh, commit such, uh, such things, who will be the, the subject of such charges. Yeah, the charges. By this point, it was almost the end of the day, and I still hadn't asked them about that. The one thing I wanted to ask about is because, and this is, I, I'm only asking because uh, we found this in a, uh, in, so there's the, you know, the U.S. government documents that have been released. Mm-hmm. They said that he was involved with that group. You know the group I'm talking about? The Moroccan group? The Moroccan group. Mm-hmm. The extremist group that the U.S. government says he joined in college, Jamaat al Adul Walisan. Was he ever affiliated with that group? They, they, uh, they said that maybe he, he was a sympathizer of the group, but he was not a member. Mm-hmm. And uh, one thing that, uh, uh, that the, Should we, we stop? Or, or? No, it's fine by me. Okay, it's good. Uh, they said that the, the more Their house is right across the street from their neighborhood mosque. <laughs> mm-hmm. Abdul Latif's sister, Meluda, was clearly agitated by the question and just kept saying they cleared him. They cleared him. And Mustafa... He's sure that his brother has done nothing wrong. It's obvious for college kids to uh, horse around uh, every now and then, but it has nothing to do with any uh, political groups or religious groups. Is everything okay? I feel like it is, I'm getting a vibe yeah. that they're a little bit upset or something. I, I don't yeah, want to make sure. You can make any no. Sure. I decided not to push it. So maybe we take a break uh, and then and until tomorrow. Uh, we had one more day of interviews, so I figured let's go back to the hotel, start fresh in the morning. I'm tired. <laughs> On the way home, I replayed the answers I got to that final question about the group, that Abdul Latif sympathized with the group but was not part of it. Even Shelby acknowledged that he had been part of that group. But the other part of the answer, about how college kids experiment, try out things without fully meaning them, I get that. When I was in college, I went to all kinds of religious ceremonies, church services and seders. At one point, I even tried out being a Wiccan. Oddly, one of the places that that spiritual flailing took me was to Morocco. When I left my fairly devout home to study, I had a real crisis of faith. I started missing prayers. So much so that I started keeping track of how many I was in the hole so I could make them up later. And the reason why I was slipping was that I didn't know what my faith meant to me anymore. Whether and how much I wanted it to define me. By my second year of university, I decided the best way to figure it out was to study Islam, to major in it. I signed up for a foreign study, three-month course in Fez, Morocco. And I remember thinking, this is the place where I'm going to figure this out once and for all. 
when I got there, I realized this weird thing. What's your name? If I introduced myself as Latif... My name is uh, Latif. Nobody would call me by my name. Latif, uh, it's a name of God. Yeah. You know that God has 99 names. Mm -hmm. And Latif, it's a name of God. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why, which was explained to me over and over, is that Latif is one of the 99 names of God in Islam. It means the most gentle or the most kind. Whereas in a place like Canada, you can get away with naming a kid that. Uh, My parents found my name in a book from our mosque library. In a Muslim country like Morocco, it's just plain weird. It's like naming your kid God. So you put Abdul in front of it. Abd Latif, slave of Abd Latif, slave. Yeah, yeah. I am slave of Abd Latif, slave of God. So Moroccans would only ever call me Abdul Latif. Because in Morocco we have the name, it's Abdul Latif. Yes. It, it was so weird to imagine, as university students, me and Abdul Latif, the other Latif, we may have been walking these same streets, going by the same name, asking ourselves the same kinds of questions, just 20 years apart. Who am I? What does my faith mean to me? What kind of future do I want? That said, I didn't join a radical fundamentalist group. I never even flirted with a group that was dangerous or violent in any way. Did he? And if so, why? An answer I definitely didn't expect after the break. This is Enrique Romero from the border town of Laredo, Texas. Radio Lab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. This is the other Latif. I'm Latif Nasser. Casablanca, day two. Right. The day got off to a strange start. Oh, he's here. He's here. He's here. Abdul Latif's brother Mustafa picked us up in his car. He was happy to see us. Our interpreter Tarek sat in the front seat, while Susie and I sat in back with Martina. There is a willingness to ask for the citizens back. We started driving back towards the family's house for the second round of interviews. There is this one guy where we already agreed uh, that he can come back, yet he didn't come back. Martina and I were chatting. In my head, I was going over my questions for the day, when all of a sudden, Mustafa, who was driving, started acting strange. Speeding up, slowing down, making sharp turns seemingly out of the blue. Something was weird. We sped through traffic. When we finally got back to the house, Mustafa just pulled up to the curb, turned the car off, but didn't get out. So we all just sat there in silence, confused. Finally, we got out, walked into the house, took off our shoes. Then Tarek turned to me and translated for me what Mustafa had told him. We were being chased. Sorry? We were being chased by the, I think, the police. But they were not wearing the uniforms. It was trying uh, to lose them. It took uh, different roads uh, to lose them. But uh, some of them eventually uh, uh, succeeded to find us. Okay. We looked out the door and parked across the street was a car. Three men were sitting in it, watching us. Maybe the house is uh, under uh, constant control. Oh, really? Should we be worried? I'm not sure, Tarek said. 
The three guys in the car never came in. They just stayed there in the car, watching the house, taking pictures every so often. I would later call the Moroccan embassy in D.C. and ask them, like, who were those guys? Were they police, intelligence? Were they monitoring the family? Were they following us? They basically said there's no way of knowing. But in the moment, I remembered what I had read in that DOD detainee assessment, that the Moroccan government had cracked down on that group that Abdul Latif may have been affiliated with. Is this what it would have been like for him? Did they follow him? I looked at Mustafa and he was clearly spooked. I asked him. Everything's okay, he said. Not very convincing. Now, just to jump forward for a second, and then we'll come back to the family. I realized that this group that might have led Abdul Latif to be surveilled, I didn't really know anything about them at all. I wouldn't learn about them until later. Because when I got home, I ended up making some calls. Hello? Hey. Hi. Hey, how are you, Latif? How are you doing? Can you hear me well? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you really well. Mohammed Dadawi. Professor of political science at Oklahoma City University. And Vish Sakthavel. I research on Algerian Islamist politics, and I'm a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. I read them passages from some of the leaked government documents just to get a gut check from them about that group. Okay, so this is from the first one. Detainee was an active member of the Islamic fundamentalist group Jamaat al Adl Wal Isan. Detainee held a lower leadership position. Jamaat al Adl Wal Isan is an extremist religious group that wants to replace the Moroccan monarchy with an Islamic state. Jamaat al Adl Wal Isan is an Islamic fundamentalist group. Interesting description. <laughs> It's interesting. I think the only thing that they got right about that is the name of the group, I think. Really? Yeah. I mean, even anyone that knows a little bit about the organization would probably kind of raise an eyebrow at the characterization in the DOD report. Each of them separately told me the story of this group, how it dated back to a time when Morocco was a very repressive monarchy. This is the Morocco of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, when Abdul Latif was young. Those are known as the years of lead. L-E-A-D. Yeah, exactly. So the years of lead. Lead, as in... The king, Hassan II, was a tyrant. He ruled as an absolute monarch. The king just ruled it with a very heavy hand. There was absolutely no room for dissent. He jailed a lot of political activists. There was a lot of torture. Thousands have been tortured, killed, and disappeared. It was very repressive. So you had this very violent, quite Western-leaning monarchy. And along comes a man named Abdusalam Yassin. An elementary school inspector. In the Ministry of Education. So basically he would go and inspect the methods, pedagogy of classes, and so on. He got fed up living under a brutal king. Went through sort of a spiritual crisis. And eventually he formed an illegal political group guided by three principles called the three no's. Which is no to violence and no to violent methods, uh, no to secrecy and clandestine activity, and no to foreign intervention or reliance on foreign, uh, foreign forces and so on. According to Vish and Muhammad, this was a pacifist group that was trying to overthrow the monarchy, but to basically bring about, bring about the, peace and free elections and their methods? Marches. Sit-ins. You know, they would have, you know, like literacy classes. They would have soup kitchens. Mm -hmm. And to make it even more ironic, Um, this group that supposedly started Abdul Latif Nasser's journey to Guantanamo Bay was formed in part to demonstrate against unlawful detention of people for no reason. The DOD report makes the group sound like ISIS. But when you look at it, it looks more like the founding fathers. Except without the muskets. Learning this, uh, it, it, it was it was a real like like it, that was a uh, there was a kind of a almost like a journalistic whiplash where I was like wait what what does it even mean to be radical if you're living in radical times 
And, and even more than that, is this the kind of bogus intelligence they're using to lock this guy up for 18 years without a trial? But then, um, I mean, you're not yeah. seeing all of the other sources of information. This is Cynthia Storer. Former CIA senior terrorism analyst and adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University. Cynthia is a bin Laden expert and has studied patterns of radicalization. And she told me, look, even if the government was wrong here, even if this was a pacifist group, that might help the case that Abdul Latif got radicalized. It takes a long time. It it takes many steps to become a terrorist. This is a nice yeah. flip a switch and I'm a terrorist, right? The pattern we saw was that the beginning is is innocent, some kind of I'm looking for something, and then the next thing is joining a group that does social justice stuff. Trying to trying to help people. Trying to help people, right? Giving you know, aid work and also protest. And the protest comes because they don't feel like they're getting done what they need to get done with the aid work, right? Uh huh. And so I'll tell you what usually triggers the next step. Yeah. What normally yeah. triggers the next step is. Repression by the government. And in this case, that did happen. During the years of lead, Yassin did something suicidally dangerous. Oh, it was unprecedented. He sent the king an open letter. Demonishing the king of Morocco. The king promptly banished Yassin to a mental asylum. By the time Abdul Latif joined the group years later, Yassin had gotten out of the asylum. The DOD said that Abdul Latif said that he and Yassin were attending a peaceful protest one day when they were both arrested. And then, according to the government, that's when Abdul Latif left the country. Okay, uh, this time I wrote down a bunch of my questions so I don't, I don't forget any. One of the first uh, questions I have, because uh, I... Back to my visit with the family, I very cautiously brought this up with Mustafa. They said that the reason that he left was because there was a crackdown on that. He was affiliated with that group, and then there was a crackdown on the group, and then he left. Mm -hmm. uh, was that the reason? Did that have anything to do with why he left or not? I I, I don't have any... I, we just saw the... No. Mustafa says absolutely not true at all. Him leaving the country had nothing to do with this group, which he disputes Abdul Latif was ever even a part of. It had to do, according to Mustafa, with his mom. In the mid 1980s, his mother, their mother, died, they say, of old age. Wow. Oh, and and so how, how old was he when his mother died? Mm, approximately 18 years old. And according to Mustafa, he was devastated when his mother died. Uh, her death upended his whole life. On top of that, he got frustrated with his school hated his teachers, who he said were lazy political appointees, and he felt like a financial burden on the rest of the family. So he decided to drop out and move to Libya. His brother was in Libya, and he was not married and had no children. There are more job opportunities there, and very well-paying jobs there. Libya's GDP at the time was five times that of Morocco's. Ah, and so then they would send money back here? Is that what you Yeah, it's send the money back to the mm -hmm. family. Uh -huh. And not only that, his plan, as best as I can gather, was while living rent-free with his brother, he would save enough money that he could apply to schools abroad and travel there to study. So he takes a bunch of jobs in Libya tried buying and selling things in the market like shoes, clothes, building materials. Worked hard for two years. Pretty much all he did was work. Didn't really make friends or go to the mosque. But here's the worst part. He didn't make much money. So now I'm trying to imagine what this would have felt like for him. You grow up the favorite, the only one to go to university. Dreams of advanced science degrees. But now you're broke in a foreign country, crashing on your brother's couch, feeling underemployed, your dreams of studying and teaching science slipping further and further away. 
And according to Shelby, things just got worse from there. His brother went back to Morocco to be with his wife. Abdul Latif lost his place to live. And that's when the full-on existential crisis really kicked in. Like, what am I doing exactly? Mm -hmm. Like, that's making the world a better place, or that's, yeah, like, what point is there right now? You know, I'm living alone, I have this job, but, like, what is my life? I understand that feeling. I think a lot of us do. We, he and I have spoken about this, and whenever he talks about uh, those decisions, it sounds a little aimless, like, that he had this general idea that he wanted to kind of, like, discover Islam and find true meaning, and and I don't think he knew exactly what that looked like. He, and, he knew that he wanted to, like, help others and that, you know. So did he want to be, like, an aid worker of some kind, or, like... I guess I'm, I'm laughing at the... The humor in such a very serious set of allegations that have crippled his life... The man didn't have a plan. Right. Like, he was just kind of like, I want to live in a society that, you know, has this greater meaning. And I'm like being like, I don't know, like understanding God better. And like he didn't. Yeah, I don't think he had a plan. Okay. Yeah. You're right. So we call this a cognitive. He's he's looking for a, a it's a cognitive opening, right? Something happens in your yeah. life that makes you rethink what you believe and who you are. That's when people tend to get sucked into groups like cults or groups with a more radical uh, framework. For those people it happens to, it's when they're facing this kind of existential dilemma in their life, generally. Mm -hmm. I am skeptical, by the way, of any, and there are some people out there who say that they figured it out and they could totally predict what a person would decide to do, and I'm very skeptical of that. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Right? I think what a person will decide is a mystery. And so at that point, Abdul Latif makes kind of a mysterious decision. Even though he hadn't been going to the mosque regularly, wasn't the most pious Muslim, he seems to get this idea. What would it be like to live in a perfect Islamic society? One that wasn't based on the whims of a king or how much money you made selling concrete at the market, what kind of education you were lucky enough to access but rather how good and faithful a person you are. You can sort of imagine the seed for it planted in him from the group he may have been involved with in university, hoping for a pacifist Muslim utopia. Or perhaps the seed was planted even deeper, a yearning to go back to the times he prayed with his mom before she died. Who knows? Ultimately, Abdul Latif decides to move to a country where he seems to have known nobody. Sudan. This is at a time before Facebook, WhatsApp, when you really could disappear. And his family says that's what happened. They completely lost touch with him. Didn't hear from him for about a decade. Until in 2005, they get a knock on the door from a woman named Rose, who worked for the Red Cross, who told them, your relative is being held at Guantanamo Bay. One of my questions, it's a, it's a kind of hard question, I guess, but do, do they believe that it's possible that their uh, brother could have done anything like this? Like, could he have done anything wrong, do they think? Is there a possibility that their brother did anything wrong? <laughs> She has no doubt that he is an innocent person. She, uh, she, she, I mean, what, what's in the, the American documents is completely false. Well, let, me, let me ask this. Um, there are times when good people, you know, they get confused. They hang out with the wrong people. Do they think there's a possibility he, you know, he, they say he was with all these very bad people, uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And is it possible he was just running with the wrong people? 
انا كنقول ممكن لانه يعني انا ما عارفش عليه هو اللي غادي يعرف يمكن الافكار لانه يعني انا فرقت منه اتس اتس بوسيبل ذات هي فيل فيكتيم فور باد بيبل و ميبي توك ادفانتج اوف هيز اوف هيز انسنس اند هيز اوف هيز انسنس اند سويد هيم انتو ذا وين باد ثينجز سو اتس هي دازنت رول ذات ذات بوسيبيليتي واش اقتنعتي بالافكار اللي قالت لك سيلفي واقتنعتي بهذه الفكره ديالو هويا؟ ار يو كونفينس بات ار يو كونفينس ذات هي از ا جود بيرسون ا لافين هيلبفول بيرسون ذاتس اول ايف اول ايف هيرد رايت اند ان ان ا واي part of the challenge of this story for me is that i can't talk to the person in the at the center of the story i i can't talk to him myself so that's why i kind of have to uh talk to them what's very difficult is that the the person they're telling me about seems so drastically different from all those records they're different people you know ولكن انا تنقول لي مادام ان تعطاه الصراحه ديالو يعني اكيد راه راه ما عنده حتى شي حاجه But his sister Khadija reminded me again they cleared him. Don't forget. He should be back home. Okay. Before we left, Khadija and Mustafa took Susie and I up this narrow flight of stairs to the third floor to show us the room they built for Abdul Latif when they heard he was getting out. He's a tall guy. He's going to have to duck like me. Okay. Oh, wow. It was a tiny little room, about six feet wide, but it was fully furnished, big bed. This is, a, this is newly built. This place is newly built. This is, a, this is a built for him. So when he comes back, he finds a place where he can, uh, where he can sleep. We walked over to a little window that looked out on a courtyard that was sort of between their house and the mosque. And there were a bunch of kids playing soccer. This is the exact place where they used to to play uh, play football when they were uh, still young. Yeah. That, that's why uh, why he chose to to have this window here so he can uh, uh, remember all the memories they had together. I thought about what it would be like for him if he ever does get out to look out this window. When for 18 years he hasn't had a window. We stood and watched the kids play soccer for a while. I wondered what makes one kid go one way and the next one go a different route. Myself, when I got to Morocco, I decided my faith was not going to be the center of my life anymore. I was going to keep studying, maybe become an academic. Abdul Latif, from what I can tell, went in the reverse direction. But I still wasn't sure why. What happened next? What version of his life story to believe? or even what what the next steps were to try to tell the story but as i was reading abdul latif nasser's dod report to mohammed dadawi it would be interesting to see um, you know once he left morocco you know what really happened to him going through his life story let's say you said libya and sudan his sense was whatever happened to this guy didn't happen in morocco it has to be later it has to be later latif i think it's later It probably happened. Sudan, I think, you know, that's probably your best bet. In Sudan. Next time on The Other Latif. Sudan.
This episode was produced by Sara Kari, Susie Lechtenberg, and me, Latif Nasser, with help from Tariq El Baraka and Amira Karaud. Fact checking by Diane Kelly and Margot Williams. Editing by Jada Boomrod and Soren Wheeler. Original music by Jada Boomrod, Alex Overington, and Amino Belliani. Tune in next week, episode three, Sudan. Hi, this is Deborah from San Francisco, California. Radio Lab is created by Jad Abumrad with Robert Krolwich and produced by Soren Wheeler. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, David Gabell, Bethel Hopti, Tracy Hunt, Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Latif Nasser, Sarah Kari, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. With help from Shima Olili, W. Harry Fortuna, Sarah Sandvak, Melissa O'Donnell, Tad Davis, and Russell Gragg. Our fact checker is Michelle Harris. And I'd really like to add, I will miss you, Robert. Thank <laughs> you.